Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Annie. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, welcome to the world of SIP. I'm joined on stage by Jake, who's part of our marketing team, and Martin, who's part of our sales engineering team. So today we're going to talk about a few things. First, I want to go over um, new and noteworthy features from last signal to this signal in the world of SIP trunking. Um, then I'm going to pass it over to Jake that's going to talk to us about elastic SIP trunking and why you want to use Twilio elastic SIP trunking and primarily go over the benefits of using a cloud provider for your SIP trunking solution. Then he's going to talk a little bit about the different use cases that we see being used with SIP trunking and uh, some customer testimonials as well. Then we're going to jump back to the platform and do a little bit deeper dive into like the resiliency and availability of the platform and some common, best common practices for configuration. And then last but not least, Martin is going to give us a really cool live demo where he's going to combine uh, pretty much, I think it's messaging, voice, and sync, uh, three different product lines that we have at Twilio all together. And uh, he's going to show you how you can configure a SIP phone in a matter of, I think it's seconds, right? Yeah, so it's pretty cool. Um, so first, let me level set this. Uh, probably not everybody's familiar with what SIP trunking is. So just at a very high level, SIP trunking gives you the ability to connect your IP communications infrastructure, which might be a PBX, a session board controller with a whole bunch of devices behind it, to the public telephone network. And um, to do that, there's typically two directions. There's a termination direction, which is when you're placing calls out to the public telephone network, and origination, which is when you're actually placing a call to a Twilio phone number, and we deliver that call through SIP to your communications infrastructure. So that's a 1,000 foot level, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. So let me show you um, some of the cool things that we actually launched this year. So the one that uh, Oi talked about at the keynote today was Voice Insights, which is really about giving you visibility into the carrier, the carrier leg of, this, of a particular call. And um, in the area of trunking, we're actually launching it in, in developer preview. So you're only going to be able to see right now the leg between Twilio and the carrier itself. And we're working to actually expose the lag between your communications infrastructure and Twilio, and that's going to be coming in the next few months. So this is the console, and um, here I'm logged into this Elastic SIP trunking product. And if I just go and look at this, some of my call logs, I placed a call yesterday. Let me just click on that. And this is what you know today, but um, you see that there's actually two new tabs here. One is an insight summary and a metrics page. So if you go into the insight summary, you'll get a little bit more information about who's, who's the calling party and the call at party. So for example, you're able to see it's like, I placed a call from a, from a Twilio phone number, which from, it was from a voice over IP device, which was a Bria client running on my laptop. And I placed a call to a PSTN phone. Um, this is the carrier that they're on, and this is actually a landline. I was calling a UCSF. And, um, the cool part, I think, is if you jump over to the metrics tab here, you're able to see at the very top of the event stream or the event list. So you're able to see when the call initiated, when it went to ring in in progress, and when the, the call actually ended. And then you're able to see the quality of, quality of service information. So we're exposing things like jitter, packet loss, and octet sent and received in both directions of the stream towards the carrier. So this was actually a pretty cool call. So the jitter was... Uh, 0.03, packet loss was pretty good in one direction. It was kind of like started with a bit of packet loss in the opposite direction and a number of octet sends. So this is in developer preview. If any of you want access, just either contact me or contact any of, the, any of my colleagues at Twilio and we can enable your account for this. The next feature I want to talk about is not necessarily a new feature, but it's a feature that in the past year, it's been actually getting a lot of pickup by our customers and I see a lot of uh, increased usage on it. And it's the ability to configure emergency calling over your Twilio SIP trunk. So let me go back to our SIP trunking product line and um, I'll show you what for me is the coolest thing. So emergency calling, calling is the ability to call 911 from your communications infrastructure uh, out to 911 essentially. And um, the part that's coolest for me, if my Wi-Fi cooperates and comes up eventually, is really just the self the self provisioning. Yeah. You're able to do everything from the console and configure the configure 911 in a matter of in a matter of minutes because it just takes about a few minutes to actually enable it. And um, the way it works, it's available in the U.S. and Canada. And uh, you essentially configure an emergency address against a particular phone number on your trunk. 
and then you just enable that, and whenever a call gets placed, that call gets routed to the right piece at, based on the address that you have configured. So let's go into uh, my Signal 17 trunk here that's already pre-configured. And this might be taking a little bit long, but um, I have a backup plan for moments like these. So let me show you. I have a GIF that actually walks through exactly the same <coughs> scenario. So here you're, you'll be able to see this is a phone number associated with the trunk. You select it, you select it, enable emergency, em, emergency calling, you select an address, you might have a pre-configured address or you can actually create a new address on the fly. Once you select it, it validates it and then you just say enable emergency calling and that's pretty much all you need to do. Um, you can see the status here, it goes to pending enablement. It usually takes about uh, anywhere from like a few minutes to up to five to 10 minutes at the most to actually get that enabled. And then whenever you place a SIP call from this particular phone number out to 911, that call will get routed to the right PSAP. So, so that's pretty cool. So let me jump over to another thing that we're launching today. We're launching in beta. So we have a new trunking region, which is Frankfurt, Germany, um, with a URI of psen.de1.twilio.com. That's available self-service from the portal today. So if your infrastructure is located in Germany or nearby Germany, definitely feel free to take advantage of it. Um, it's gonna remain in beta for a while. We're still working on our onboarding more carriers from that particular data center, but, um, but it's really exciting to have another European region as well. Another announcement that we heard from Jeff uh, on the first day of the keynote was our ever-expanding phone number inventory. So since last signal, we've deployed in over 20 new countries with phone numbers availability. And for me, the, the most exciting part is that there's actually 27 new countries where we have international toll-free phone numbers available. And those are avail available to use on your SIP trunk as well. Um, the other cool thing that we did uh, about probably six to seven months ago is about differentiating our pricing and passing that, the benefits that we get from our carriers down to our customers. So one case that was coming up often enough was calls to, to certain European countries. They're actually cheaper when you call from within Europe to, the, to those particular countries than if you're calling from the rest of the world. So if you're placing a call to Austria from say Germany, that call will be cheaper than if you're placing a call from Mexico to, to Germany, for example. So now we're differentiating our pricing based on where, where you're actually calling from. One thing that's important to do to note when you're actually using SIP is we're looking at the from URI and that from URI needs to be properly formatted in E164 format in order for the right pricing to actually take effect. So definitely keep that in mind. So with that, let me pass it over to Jake who's gonna to talk to us about why our customers are using SIP trunking. Thanks, Annie. So just to reintroduce myself, my name is Jake. <clears throat> I work on our product marketing team here at Twilio, uh, specifically with our SIP trunking product. So one of the great things about my job is I get to spend most of my time trying to talk with customers, figure out how they, how they feel about the product, what they like, you know, what they don't like, and get feedback. So out of curiosity, just a quick question to start. How many of you have played around with Twilio SIP trunking before? Okay, a handful or so. So wanted to go over, if you're a, you know, IT administrator, a, a voice application designer, why is it that you would choose Twilio or another cloud SIP trunking provider for your needs? Well, there's a few main reasons I don't want to talk through with you guys. First is global availability. So throughout the course of the keynotes yesterday and today and some of the other sessions, you guys have heard a lot about Twilio Super Network. So the ability to partner with one SIP tracking provider one time and have a globally available network of phone numbers and connectivity to tier one providers is a huge win for our customers. Another great piece of feedback I hear from our customers is around our self-service nature. So obviously we're an API company, right? Everything that we do, we have an API for, and that's no different with SIP trunking. You can set up, configure, associate phone numbers, you know, set your IP access control list, all using a programmable API, or using console, which Annie just demonstrated to you. This allows you to move really quickly. You don't have to actually get on the phone with your SIP tracking provider, you know, provision additional lines, whatever it may be, you can move at your own speed. Next is elastic scaling. So because we're based on a very dynamic cloud AWS backbone, we can scale up and down with your usage. 
So whether you're in a seasonal business or you just have changing needs, depending on when you're using your service, we'll scale up automatically as your use case increases and down as, as it contracts. And with that, that cloud backing comes increased reliability. So everything that we do, we design with fault tolerance in mind. This means for you that you can promise your customers, your employees, that you're going to be an always-on solution, and you're not going to go down or have outages. And lastly is omnichannel. So SIP Trunky is just one of the many products that we offer, um, whether it's voice, video, SMS, chat, or a whole host of other different products. We have an entire suite for you to take advantage of. So what is our overall goal? Our goal is to be your one single platform for any use case. And let's take a look at what some of those use cases are that we see on our platform today. So first and foremost, call center. Whether that's a sales call center, inbound support call center, uh, customers choose Twilio because of that global availability network of phone numbers. So we see a, a variety of different call center players that come to us using our SIP trunking. Alerts and notifications. So that elastic scaling that we offer you means that you can use Twilio as your alerts and notifications provider, and we have enough capacity to scale up and down with you for those mission critical alerts. Office phone systems. PBXs, SBCs, conference lines, uh, desk phones, whatever it may be, we see a lot of customers use us to power their internal SIP infrastructure. And conferencing. For those customers that have either internal conference bridges or customer-facing conference bridges and need to add a dial-in phone number, that's a pretty common use case we see as well. So what are some actual customers that use us in these spaces? Uh, Ruby Receptionist. They just gave a talk a little while ago. Ruby Receptionist is a virtual receptionist uh, uh, company, and what they offer is a delightful call-in experience for their customers. So they essentially provide outsource receptionist services. And Ruby decided to go with Twilio because chief for them was quality. They wanted to make sure whatever SIP tracking provider they went with was going to have superior quality, and um, using, Ruby decided to use our interconnect product to set up a private connection between us and them to ensure that they had that top quality. Next is Blackboard. So Blackboard is a very powerful alerts and notifications platform that works with uh, the education sector, um, government, cities, whatever it may be, to send out mission critical alerts. So that can be, hey, school's closed today, it's a snow day, don't bring your kid in, or emergency notifications from your city government. Uh, because of the nature of their use case, it's a very uh, elastic need that they have. They might have to send out a huge number of alerts and notifications in a short period of time, and then during the summer months, those alerts and notifications aren't being sent out as frequently because there's less schools in session. Uh, Twitter. You guys are all probably familiar with Twitter. If you were here at Signal last year, you may have heard Stephen Platt, who is a systems engineer, talk through Twitter's carrier consolidation project that he led. So Twitter, very fast growing company, opening up offices all over the world. And what they found, what Steven found, is he was actually being slowed down in his ability to op uh, open new offices because he would have to go to each individual office location, set up a new relationship with a specific telco in that region, and it would take too much time. So it's pretty ridiculous for a company like Twitter to be slowed down by the need to onboard a new carrier in every office that they open when they could just partner with somebody like Twilio. Um, Steven is also you know, pretty excited about that E911 capability that Annie demoed. And lastly, LifeSize. LifeSize is a great example of a conferencing provider that uses us. So LifeSize provides a voice dial-in number um, to any customer that they have in you know, over 70 countries today. And as Jeff mentioned, we'll be in over 100, company, uh, sorry, 100 countries this summer. And that allows them to partner with tier one providers all across the globe. So whoever's calling in from wherever they're calling in, they're going to have a great call-in experience, and they have unlimited call concurrency. So our usage, is, our uh, pricing is very simple. It's pay-per usage. They don't have to do capacity planning. They don't have to pay for capacity that's going unused. They're only getting charged once somebody's actually using that dial-in line. So, so those are just some of the great examples of customers that we see today. And we're always seeing new customers use our SIP trunking in innovative ways. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Annie, who's going to talk, to talk through some of how we're able to achieve our globally redundant and resilient platform. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. So let's take a look at the platform. Uh, we're deployed in eight regions around the world. And um, the way to access them is by the localized URI. So you can see it on the screen on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And um, it's really important that you want to point your infrastructure to the region that's closest to wherever you're located, and not only from a geographical proximity, but more so from an internet connectivity proximity. So if you're here in San Francisco, you probably want to connect to our US2 region. If you're in New York, probably US1, and so on. 
Um, the other important thing is you do want to configure your PB access or SBCs to, to have failover routes in case um, in case you lose connectivity to one region because um, your internet provider had an issue or anything along those lines, you want to have a backup route. So for example, if you're connected to US2, you want to have a backup route to US1 as well, just, just to be on the safe side. So that gives you inter-regional redundancy. But now let's actually talk about uh, intra-regional redundancy, which I think is really interesting. So within a particular region, so let's say um, IE1, we're actually deployed in three different data centers at the same time, and each of one of these data centers are isolated locations. Now, each data center will have hot standby servers, so if one fails, there's another one that's able to take the active traffic immediately from the get-go. Um, now, all of these data centers have redundant power, connectivity, and th they're interconnected by low latency links as well. Now, one common configuration error that we see is customers typically resolve these localized URIs and they only pin themselves to a single IP address and they're not able to take advantage of this inter redundancy that we have. So it's really important that when you, when you use these localized URIs, when you resolve the IP addresses, you'll typically get a list of three or four different signaling IP addresses back that you actually rotate through all of them. So if the first one fails, try the second one, try the third, and try the fourth one. That way you're actually trying all of the data centers that we have deployed around in a particular region. And then if all of those fails, which is highly unlikely, then you can try sort of like the, and the next region that you might have configured as a failover route. So that's taking care of the traffic coming from your infrastructure into the Twilio cloud. So let's talk about calls going in the opposite direction. Once that we actually receive a call to Twilio and we want to deliver it to your infrastructure, you also want to have similar redundancy, load balancing, and failover capabilities. So the way we actually configure this is we have something called origination URIs, which are part of your SIP trunk. And in your origination URIs, you're able to configure from anywhere from one from up to 10 different origination URIs. And the cool thing is that you're able to associate different weights and priorities. So in the example I have up here, we actually have uh, three different SBCs with origination URIs with the same priority. So I'm actually achieving load balancing across those URIs. And then I have a fourth URI with a higher priority, which is going to be my backup SBC as well. So that way I mean, you're, all, you're able to achieve failover towards your infrastructure. Um, so that, that's everything on sort of like the public edge towards your infrastructure. Now let's talk about the other edge, which is our carrier edge. And that's where our super network comes in. So our super network is again deployed in uh, seven data centers and we're expanding to our eighth, da eighth data center around the world. And um, essentially we have hundreds of carrier connections from each one of the, the, the different data centers that we have. And what's really cool is with all of the redundancy that I talked about, both inter-regional and intra-regional redundancy on the public edge is also available on our carrier edge. So we have that same level of re reliability as well. Um, the other thing that happens with our carriers is we not only have a single carrier for every call, we have a depth of typically five, six, or seven carriers for every call that you route out to the public telephone network. So if one carrier fails, we're able to, to route to the second carrier and so on. And then not only that, we actually have systems in place and teams in place that are continuously monitoring all of these carriers from uh, not, not only like an uptime availability, but they're also monitoring the quality of service, the answer seizure rate, make sure that everything is working as expected. And if something goes wrong for any reason, we actually take them out of route until we are confident that they're able to adequately deliver your calls appropriately. And um, this team has only grown in the past years. It keeps, uh, it keeps getting better and better. So the, reli or the reliability just continues to get better for you as well, which is amazing. So with that, now I'm gonna jump onto another topic. So I'm gonna talk about a product called Twilio Interconnect. We launched Twilio Interconnect about a year and a half ago, and it was really about giving flexibility to our customers. So for SIP trunking, we were originally only providing it over the connectivity over the public internet, and we started to run into customers that this was something that was not sufficient for them, and they were actually looking for private connections into the Twilio cloud. And that's what brought us to actually work on something called Twilio Interconnect. So for Twilio Interconnect, there's three different types, well, there's four exchanges around the world today. There's two, two interconnect exchanges in the US, one in Ashburn and one in San Jose. Then we recently deployed one in London and another one in Singapore. And these physical exchanges then actually connect to the eight different data centers that we have around the world. 
Now, as far as the types of private connectivity that we offer, there's three different categories of connections that we do. The first one is called Cloud Connect. And this is the case if you're actually deployed in, say, AWS VPC and you want to connect directly to our VPC where we're deployed, you can use Cloud Connect through our Twilio Interconnect Exchange to achieve that. So the things to just watch out for is we have to be in the same VPC. So if you're in US 1, we are in US 1. We just have to be in the same one. Uh, but, but it's a really cool feature, and it, it's something that we're going to evolve to other cloud providers as well. So we're looking into Google and Microsoft as well for this. The next category is something that we call network peering. And within network peering, there's two types of connections that we offer. The first one is cross-connect. So this is actually a physical cross-connect between our Cajun Equinix and your Cajun Equinix. And um, one common question that we, had, that, that we actually get is like, well, what happens if I'm not in the same Equinix data center as you are? We actually have partners available that we can introduce you to to actually help you reach our exchanges independent of wherever your data centers are. Um, so those are definitely options. The other type of network peering connection that we have is something called MPLS, which you might be more familiar with. So this is, for example, if your infrastructure is already connected to you, like if you're, all your data centers are interconnected by an MPLS backbone offered by companies like Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, or whatnot, you're able to connect to our exchanges as well using those MPLS connections. Today in the US, we support uh, Verizon MPLS connectivity, and we're expanding the number of providers that we actually have on the MPLS network as well. And then the third category of connections that we have is VPNs. We see this a lot for uh, very quick testing or smaller scale, scale deployments, where it's essentially just an IPsec tunnel over the public internet. Um, and there's a lot of enhancements that we're actually actively working on right now to make this um, self-service and API-driven provisioning to actually configure your VPN as well. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is the actual products that we support over these private connections. There's three products that we support. One of them is Elastic SIP Trunking, the second one is SIP Interfaces, and then the third one is our WebRTC clients. So those are like the three different products that you're able to take advantage through private connectivity to Twilio. So with that, um, let me pass it over to Martin, who's actually going to give us a pretty interesting demo. Cool. Thanks, Annie. Uh, let's see if I can talk and type for a second while I wake my laptop up and get the demo ready here. It is waking up. If we could switch the laptop input. Just to reconnect, the hardest part of this entire demo was actually getting my phone screen to display on the laptop. The SIP part was really easy. So basically, the, the nature of this demo is I want to really showcase how like, quick and simple it is to set up SIP with Twilio. Uh, I come from a long carrier SIP background, and setting up SIP has like, historically uh, been kind of time consuming and difficult. Uh, really with uh, Twilio both, the SIP platform itself combined with the power of our APIs uh, just makes the whole thing ridiculously easy. Uh, and that's what I wanted to showcase. Um, it's hard to demo uh, like the SIP trunking product itself unless one of you guys brought a PBX with you and most people don't. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate setting up SIP soft clients just registered directly with um, uh, Twilio SIP platform and then just start making and receiving phone calls. So the, uh, the first thing I want to do is I need to get myself a phone number uh, and configure Twilio on the back end to support my SIP calls. Um, and my thought with the demo is like with Twilio, everything has to be triggered by a text message. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to text my email address to this number, 202-TEXT-SIP, uh, which is 202-8398-747. Uh, and this is something that anybody can do. This, this phone number is wide open to kind of try out Twilio SIP. So there's a really simply a simple piece of application code on the back end, receives this message through the Twilio platform. Um, one API call buys the phone number. It bought me 510-279-4601. That's my new phone number. Uh, a second API call provision Twilio SIP credentials on the back end, and then a little piece of Twilio to respond to my text message. So we've executed about five lines of code right now, and I seem to have a Twilio phone number. So obviously I need to actually make calls through it, uh, so I'm going to check my email for the information on how to configure the soft client side of it and actually register my phone against Twilio. Uh, 
And what we're gonna do here to save a whole bunch of typing is actually configure the client using a QR code. Uh, so we're using uh, the Grandstream Wave SIP stuff client, uh, and that can simply be configured by QR code, assuming the Wi-Fi comes through for me here. And just in case it doesn't, we'll go with the email on my phone as a backup to get the same QR code. Excellent. My phone loaded it, even my laptop didn't. Uh, so I'm just going to download this image. Open the SIP soft client, which is basically completely unconfigured right now. And then I can add the Twilio account I just created using the QR code image I just downloaded from my email, which would be this one. And you see it's gone green, so the soft client's now registered. So in the space of I had the two minutes I've been talking, uh, half of which I've been waiting for Wi-Fi, I've got myself a SIP line configured here on Twilio. Uh, and Jake, if you just want to go ahead and give me a call to this number, 510-279-4601, and we'll make sure it works. And there's my call from Jake. And we'll put him on speaker too. Hey, Jake, how's it going? It's going good. Ready for bash tonight. Excellent. My speaker's super quiet. Try it again. <laughs> hello, hello. hello, hello. Testing, there we testing. go. So, yeah, and it's basically now three minutes, Twilio set working. <laughs> and since it all seems implausibly easy, other than the Wi-Fi, uh, you should absolutely give that a try yourselves uh, and send a text, uh, 202 text SIP, um, text your email address. You'll get exactly the same. You'll get a phone number. You'll get the, the link to the QR code. And you can try Twilio SIP for yourselves. Um, and with that, I'll uh, hand back to Jake. Thanks. So just wanted to wrap up and say, you know, it's it's really exciting to be able to talk with you guys about SIP trunking. Um, we've got some members of the SIP trunking team that are going to be outside in the hallway just here. We'd love to chat with you, talk to you a little bit more about how you might be able to use SIP trunking today. Um, here, if you've already used the product, any feedback that you have. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys all at Bash later tonight. Appreciate you sticking around for a, a uh, SIP trunking talk for the second to last session of the second day. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks.